Welcome, welcome. Glad to see everybody. We're waiting for people to get logged in here. So glad to have so many already here with us today. It's kind of exciting. It's a beautiful Tuesday. I think it's pretty windy here where I'm at in Bountiful. Is it windy all over the state or just up here? I think the wind advisory is supposed to be for at least how long? Another couple of days. We uh, tied down our trampoline and we pulled in all the garbage cans and my carport is kind of a, uh, uh, when the wind blows, everything collects into my carport. <laughs> all the leaves, all the dust, it all finds its way right, right into my carport. So we're constantly sweeping that thing out. It's kind of funny. And I don't know if there's any way around that. It's like, not like the wind is aimed at it, maybe because the wind's blowing past. And then because this is like a, an indent, the wind going past finds a way in to bring everything in. It's gotta be something like that. All right, let's see, who do we have here? Welcome Esther, welcome Ian, JDL. Is it Tamrat? Glad you're here. York, good to have you. Larry, just logged in, good. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we've got a fun day today. Um, Thank you. Today, yeah, good to have you here. Uh, where are you dialing in from today? This is Jeff JDL. I'm dialing in from Logan. Logan, nice. Is it windy up there? It is. In fact, Richmond is supposed to be maybe 71 miles an hour as far as winds wow. tomorrow morning. So it's wow. going to get windy up here. I, yeah, that sounds like very much fun. <laughs> I think it's only supposed to get to 50 miles an hour in Bountiful this time where I'm at, um, but we've certainly seen heavier winds than that before. So, so I sympathize with whatever is going to happen to you in the yeah, up there in Cache Valley this uh, tomorrow. <laughs> okay, well, our topic today is going to be on um, on policing real estate agents on the um, Division of Real Estate in Utah and the um, Real Estate Commission and how they enforce the rules and what the rules are. And um, it's not one of the topics that's as sexy as some of the other real estate topics, but it is one that is tested on the exam. So, so we're going to hit it so that you're ready for it when you get to the exam. Um, I spend, I actually spend a lot of time working with the commission and with the division. Um, uh, not all the educators do, but I, uh, I spend every month they've got the commission meeting at the Division of Real Estate, and I'm there uh, pretty much every month uh, listening to the commissioners discuss possible new rules, listening to the investigators talk about the, um, the problems that they have and the fines they're doling out and what happened that led to the problem, uh, what the agent did, what the clients did, and, and hearing all those stories. So so I see a lot of what's going on in the industry and, uh, and the commissioners that we have are, are really smart. I love the people that they've got in position right now. Um, I think we've got one from St. George and then they don't let more than one be from each county, right? If you remember that. Um, but so they try and represent all over the state. Um, although I don't think they have one from Davis County right now. So maybe I should, maybe I should go apply. <laughs> That's probably something I need to be another 10 years old to do so, <laughs> but uh, uh, but it's kind of cool. Uh, you, in those meetings, you usually have the uh, director of the Division of Real Estate. You've got their director of education. You've got all their staff. If you've ever had to call the Division of Real Estate to ask them a question, a lot of those staff members are in those commission meetings that I attend. Um, uh, but it's really cool to see a lot of the stuff that they do and the, and the thought process that goes behind some of the rules and and our commissioners, I do find to be pretty fair. So whenever something goes wrong, when an agent breaks one of the rules, um, they usually uh, do a pretty good job of treating people fairly. I don't see them. Uh, I, I just watched a movie, uh, the what's it called? The Trial of the Chicago Seven, I think is the name of the movie. It's Oscar nominated and it covers a court case from 40, 50 years ago. Um, and as the movie goes, the judge in the court case is extremely biased, totally not fair. 
and uh, and I think I saw in the historical notes afterward that he was removed from his position and and that like 80% of legal reviews said that he was uh, biased and shouldn't have been in that position. So, so we definitely have seen some of that over the history of our country, right? You see people put in a position of a, a courtroom judge or a police officer or a, or a mayor or a, or a politician or a congressman or whatever, someone in a position of power where occasionally those people don't hold true to their, um, to their ideals and to their oaths and they, um, and they use their position of power to potentially hurt people. Luckily, it's the minority of the time that that happens, but it does happen. But I would say within our commission, within the state of Utah, um, that our commissioners are pretty good. And the staff members of the Division of Real Estate are, are pretty good trying to do what's best for the industry. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't had my frustrations with them sometimes. Sometimes the uh, goals of a real estate school or the goals of a real estate agent are not perfectly aligned with the with the division um, but they align almost completely seeing as how we're both in it to to make the industry a better place for agents and for clients so so it's been really great working with them um, and so and so it's kind of fun for me to talk about them because I've been there and I've been part of those meetings. But for those of you who never have been, it feels kind of foreign. You don't have an idea of um, what the commission's like, what the division of real estate is like. And so when the core starts telling you about um, who appoints the commissioners and who makes the rules and who enforces the rules and all of it sounds just very, um, uh, how would you put it? It's just, it's, it's abstract. It's like, this is stuff you have no firsthand understanding of. And so sometimes that can be difficult to kind of visualize what, uh, uh, what the uh, uh, makeup of it is and what the purpose of it is. And sometimes you start to wonder, why do I even need to know who appoints these people or who, um, who's going to make decisions if something goes wrong, because I'm never going to I'm never going to break the law. I'm never going to have to go before the commission and defend myself against uh, something wrongdoing. And uh, and we all start out thinking that, and most of us uh, hold true to that 90% of the time. Um, but sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we do. I know a broker down in St. George who, um, uh, and St. George is a wonderful place. This is nothing wrong with St. George. Actually, my I have two sisters who live down there. Uh, and I was born there, so there is that too. But anyway, in this particular example, the uh, the broker um, was doing something that he thought was uh, normal, like industry standard. He thought people are always doing this. And when someone makes that excuse, this is the way it's always been done, you already know they're kind of leading off on the wrong track, right? But But when he came before the commission because he had broken a rule, the rule he had broken was that they were they had an inappropriate relationship with a lender. Now, it's not a problem to be friends with lenders and to refer to lenders back and forth, but what you can't do by law is you can't give uh, kickbacks. You can't give, um, you can't pay a lender to send you clients, just like they can't pay a real estate agent um, to send clients to them. And so they had done a shared deal together, which, which crossed the line. They had done a deal together, which had uh, crossed the line into the territory of passing compensation back and forth for referrals. And so, uh, but, but before that, you would have looked at him as a reputable broker. And I want to stress still that they are still a reputable broker today, as, and maybe even more so now that this one thing that they misunderstood and thought might have been okay, um, now they understand why it wasn't okay. And, uh, and so I would actually say that they're a more trustworthy broker now that they have actually uh, learned this, this detail. So that's, that's a funny thing about, uh, about uh, like the, in the division newsletter, they actually list every quarter, they list every single real estate agent, it's public record that has been fined, that has had their license put on probation, that has had their license revoked. All of that is on the public record and it's in the division newsletter. So back in the, uh, back in the old days, 10, 20 years ago, uh, they used to send out the newsletter by mail. And so all the brokers, all the agents would every, every quarter, every couple of months, they would get that newsletter and they'd be pouring over the names to see if any of their friends or any agents that they knew uh, 
had been brought before the division of real estate and and it was kind of amusing kind of kind of sad at the same time but uh but i like to stress that when someone does makes a mistake that doesn't make them a bad agent right and so and so i i don't think we should be looking for all the bad people necessarily certainly if there's something large and egregious and we'll talk about a couple of those types of instances uh, as we get into the details here um, then we should take that into account. Um, but some of the things that people do are honest mistakes and yes, they were wrong. Yes, they need to learn and yes, they need to do better. But sometimes uh, as long as the person who was harmed uh, gets reparations, like if a client lost money because of a mistake an agent made and the agent's able to, to give them that money or somehow that client is able to be uh, restored uh, so that the problem doesn't still exist, then then I believe it's totally appropriate for an agent to uh, to allow that to be put behind them, to learn their lessons, move forward, and continue to serve clients in a wonderful way. So, so with that introduction, I guess I would say if there's any questions throughout, feel free to throw them into the chat or just unmute yourself and ask the question and we'll answer it because that's what we're here for. We're here to answer your questions on the course and any details that you run into. Um, one thing we advertise is on our website with the pre-licensed course is what we call a reverse classroom. And what that means is uh, you don't come to a live class and listen to a lecture and spend and have to be there from this specific time to that specific time and then go home and when you're studying there's no one there to answer your questions. Instead, you get to go and watch the lectures, read the book, uh, on your own time, whenever, night or day, whenever it fits around your work schedule. And then when you have questions, that's when you have access to an instructor. So that's what we're here for. We're here to answer your questions today. And uh, and we actually did have scheduled to have Rick Roller here with us today, but he had something come up where he wasn't able to make it. So I would like to excuse him, um, but hopefully we can still get it, all of your questions, burning questions answered. We'll get that taken care of, okay? Um, but if there are no questions immediately right now, then let's dive into some of my questions and see if we can't uh, spark some of your memory here on some of the stuff you've been learning. All right. Okay, so here's a question. D has been buying new houses and instead of selling his old houses, he has rented them each and he now has six houses that he owns and he is renting and managing on his own. And so which is true? So as you look at these answers, go ahead and call them out or type them into the chat. So A says D needs a real estate license. B says what D is doing is illegal. C says D must be an attorney. And D says that D does not need a real estate license. So what do you think guys? Which one of these is true? I think it is D. D, is that the consensus? Why do we think that he does not need a real estate license? They're his own properties. He's the owner. And he's not having to do it through anyone else. Okay, good. Yeah. So there is no law that says you can't buy or sell your own property on your own. And so, yeah, this uh, D does not need a real estate license, okay? So that's kind of a key aspect to the whole licensing thing. We only need a license to help other people buy and sell their properties and only if we're getting paid for it. So like if I, if my, if I wasn't licensed and, and my uh, family member or my friend needed help selling their house and, and they asked me to help them out, I can do that. If I'm not licensed, I'm probably not very good at it, but it's legal that I could go and help them. We can research it together and do it all together as long as I'm not getting paid for it. But if they pay me for it, then that triggers the need to have the license, right? Okay, good. On the right track so far. All right, another question. Okay, B has a real estate license, but is currently inactive. They sold their house and bought a new one, which is true. B should have activated their license before buying or selling a home. B does not need an active real estate license to buy or sell their own home. Or B must consult a broker before buying or selling a home. Or B must take continuing education before buying or selling a home. Kind of the same thing, right? 
kind of the same question asked a different way. So yeah, that's right. You got B and yeah, B. They do not need an active real estate license to buy or sell their own home. Now there is one requirement to remember though, that if you have a license, even if it's inactive, if you are buying or selling your own home, you do have to disclose that you do have a license. And so then you would put something like owner broker or owner agent on your sign if you're selling your house by yourself. So that's kind of a separate requirement there. Okay, we all good? We understand all this? In that case, I assume none of you are getting a license just to buy or sell your own homes unless you're doing it so that you can get access to some of the agent resources that are out there, stuff like the multiple listing service, things like that. Okay, so we were kind of talking about the uh, commission, the real estate commission and the division, and we're gonna dive into some questions about that, but I wanted to just kind of illustrate uh, how it's all organized like that. So what we have here is we've got the legislature who makes all the laws, the criminal laws, and we've got our governor, who is technically the head of the um, of the enforcement, right? They he, they help to enforce the laws. So, uh, and I put here the crown. So the governor is like the king of the state, right? Now, of course, here in America, we don't believe in kings. We don't believe anybody's born into any rights or privileges, and so we elect them. Now, there is certainly some influences that make some people. Uh, more easily electable than others. I think money is one of those primary things, um, but anybody can get money, right? So, so the core uh, aspect of the government is sound where any, uh, anybody has an opportunity to rise as high as they're able. Okay, so the legislature makes laws and the governor uh, has a role here as well. So when we start talking about the uh, division of real estate, first we got to talk about the Department of Commerce. So our government sets up all these departments to manage the different parts of the economy. The Department of Commerce specifically manages a lot of the economic stuff where the Department of Justice does the police and the jails and things, for example. The Department of Commerce does a lot of the um, yeah, economic stuff, stuff that has to do with businesses and transactions and, and anything to do with money. Okay, so they've got the Department of Commerce, but then there's lots of aspects of commerce and so they've got lots of divisions and one of those is the division of real estate. Now you notice I put a little tagline there uh, on the side that says protect the public. So that is the primary role of the division of real estate. So before we had laws and rules uh, in the wild west there's a couple of tv shows I really like. Um, one of them is called uh, Deadwood. It was an HBO show uh, but the premise of the show was that this was a, a town that was not incorporated. It was a, a society of people around mines and things that was outside of the state. They were not part of the state. They were not an incorporated city. And so therefore they were kind of outside the law. And so growing up in a, in a, a suburb, right? The suburb of our country where law is just part of our life. And then to um, learn more about the these situations that used to be more common where on the frontier where there wasn't a, a particular uh, lawman or lawmaker or law enforcer. All of those things were, uh, it, it was very interesting to me to see uh, how, how things were different in that environment when you don't have a guarantee that there is a law or that someone's gonna enforce a law. Um, but that's where, uh, that's kind of the basis for where all of this came about. So we've got our division of real estate, they are here to protect the public. Uh, basically from sharks, you know, from, from people who are trying to profit off of other people's ignorance or their stupidity or, or whatever. And sometimes, especially if they're gonna like lie about it. One of the most famous land schemes in the past was to sell a plot of land somewhere somebody had never been. And then when they get there, they find out that there's no roads to access their land. So they can't even use their land because it doesn't have any access to, to, to the roads or to water or whatever it is. That, that, was, a, that was a famous uh, scam back in the old days. And so 
And so that it's those types of scams that brought about all of these laws about you have to disclose certain things about the property, right? And you will be held liable, of course, if you lie about it, but not only lie about it, you'll be held liable if you hide things and just don't say them if they're material to the property. So that's where we're coming in here. So Division of Real Estate now has a director, which I like to call the real estate police. This is where uh, unlike the regular police who enforce all of the regular laws, the real estate police, the director of the division of real estate with his licensing staff and his investigators, they enforce the laws specifically around real estate licensees. So before you have your real estate license, if you don't have a real estate license, then the division of real estate has no jurisdiction over what you do. You buy and sell houses, you know, you rent your house to somebody, you buy an apartment complex and rent it to lots of people. Um, all of those things you can do and the division of real estate basically doesn't have any jurisdiction over what you're doing. They, people who do have jurisdiction are the municipalities and the police and, and those, okay? That, uh, that can enforce all the human rights laws and things like that. But as soon as you get your real estate license, you are voluntarily putting yourself under the jurisdiction of the director of the division of real estate. Okay. So their main purpose is of course, to protect the public. So help them in all these situations where they could be taken advantage of in a real estate transaction. Okay. So they appoint a real estate commission. Now the director of the division of real estate is a government employee. They work for the government. The real estate commission is just a little bit different. The director recognizes that he doesn't know everything about what's going on in the real estate industry. And so they wanted a team of experts to come and tell them uh, what's going on in the industry, what, uh, what problems are there, what types of laws could we make to fix those problems. So they uh, get five experts from the industry. These are active agents, active brokers that are currently working in real estate and that's the real estate commission, okay? And they are appointed by the governor. So that kind of comes from outside. The director of the division of real estate uh, runs the day-to-day uh, -day operations of the division, but they rely on the real estate commission, which meets once a month to, uh, to make decisions about uh, agents that have broken the rules. So if the licensing staff investigates that somebody did a, uh, a unlawful advertisement or did a marketing scheme with a, with a lender where they were giving commissions back and forth, like we talked about, then the licensing staff and, and the investigators, they propose fines and a revocation of license and things. And then they put that before the real estate commission. And then the real estate commission basically acts like the jury deciding whether that is a good fine or not, or what the agent deserves it, okay? And it doesn't follow exactly the same process as you do in a court of law because, um, uh, because the rules are a little bit different. Um, if there was criminal activity that happened that was outside the jurisdiction of the Department of Commerce, that would just go outside of this process and just be handled under regular court of law. But if it's a licensing issue where a real estate agent didn't represent someone properly, didn't disclose everything they should, didn't do everything in the best interest of their clients, that's where you come before the real estate commission. And the real estate commission then makes a decision based on what uh, the evidence shows, okay? And they make the rules. It's kind of an important distinction. They make rules for real estate agents, which is a little bit different than the laws that the legislature makes. So actually this year, in fact, they've been talking about changing some of the rules about um, brokers. So a couple of years ago, they made a rule about how many uh, offices a broker could supervise. Do you guys remember from the class how many offices a broker can supervise at one time? Three total. One. Uh, three. It used to be one, and then a couple of years ago, they changed that to three, okay? Um, but now they're, they've been talking about it and they're deciding and they're looking at the industry and the real estate commission and the, and the real estate agents are deciding or, or realizing that agents don't work in physical offices anymore so much, right? Some do, some don't, 
but whether an agent is supervised by a broker has less and less to do with a physical office where they all congregate and and more to do with just a, a, um, a non-physical structure where the broker uses electronic uh, contract databases to track the agent's contracts and to make sure everything's reviewed properly. And so, uh, and so what they've decided is that basing supervision on a certain number of offices, and that is still the law right now, three offices. So if you go and take the real estate exam anytime in the next three or four months, it's going to be a, a broker can only supervise three offices. Um, but the Utah legislature a month ago actually passed a law that took that limit away. Now those laws don't go into effect immediately. So that law is, is not going to take effect probably till May 15th. And then not only that, the real estate commission is going to have to make some rules about uh, that new law. So the legislature just barely changed the law that said a broker has to can only supervise three offices. They basically reworded it so that it's not based on a number of offices anymore. Now it's going to be based on um, uh, the concept of um, supervision and what they call safe harbor. So a broker will be expected to supervise their agents. They already are. Um, but now it won't be based on the office the agent works in. It's going to be based on uh, some principles of proper supervision. And that's what the real estate commission is now going to put into the rules. So they're going to outline specifically what the broker has to do to show that they are supervising their agents no matter where they are because it's not dependent on number of offices anymore. But that's still on the exam right now. It's still the effective law right now that a broker can only supervise three offices. So stick with that for now, but keep an eye out for the future when this new rule comes out and, and see how they change it up a little bit. I think it's a good idea. I think it's progressive, but uh, progressive in the way of it's, it's the industry has already shifted this way. So now the law needs to catch up with it. So I guess it's actually not progressive so much as it's catching up with the way work's already being done. So, okay, so the Real Estate Commission now, they make the rules, not the laws, that's the legislature. And there are five members, right? So four of them are professionals, real estate professionals, agents or brokers, and they all have to be from different counties. And then one other. So the fifth member is not a active real estate professional, but they do usually pick someone in a related industry so that they would have some knowledge of what's going on. So it's like, a, it's usually a, a mortgage lender or a title officer or an appraiser. It's usually someone in one of these related industries, okay? But the real estate commission then holds the hearings, which is kind of like the real estate agent courtroom um, where you get a chance to make your case. You can even bring an attorney with you if you want. And, uh, and in fact, at the last commission meeting that we did have a hearing where the client was there and uh, they did have a lawyer there present and the lawyer was speaking for the agent uh, representing them for this, uh, um, for this fine that they were gonna receive, okay? So, the real, so now we've got a question. The Utah Real Estate Commission is appointed by, and this is something we just went over. So some of these next few questions are gonna be a little review based on what we just went over. But our choices here are the governor, a committee by election or by the Department of Commerce. So do you remember this one from the class or from our little review we just did? Hey, the governor. It will be A. Yep, A, the governor. Okay, real uh, the governor appoints the real estate commission. That's right. Okay, and who defines the standards of conduct for the real estate brokers? Is it the real estate commission, the director of the division of real estate, director of education, or the attorney general? The commission. Yeah. Yeah, it's the commission. Now the director of the division of real estate, what does he do? He's a policeman. He's yeah, he does the enforcement, right? So someone breaks the law, the director of the division of real estate with his investigators, they figure out everything that happened and they lay down the law. But the real estate commission is the one that wrote the rules. Like I talked about with this new rule that they're uh, working on right now, it's the commission that's gonna decide what classifies um, proper supervision of brokers. But then after they've made those rules, if the 
uh, broker fails to properly supervise that agent, then it's going to be the director of the division of real estate and his staff that come down and investigate and and decide what kind of penalties they'll have to put in. Okay, what about for property management companies? Who creates rules for property management companies? Are they different? Is it the director of division of real estate, director of education, real estate commission? The commission sets the rules. It's the commission. Is it a different license to do property management versus uh, real estate sales? I don't think it is. You have to register with the division. It is the same license. There is just one real estate license that does property management or real estate sales or commercial sales or commercial leasing or residential leasing or vacant land sales or industrial sales. It's all the same real estate license for any of those activities. So yeah, they're all managed by the real estate commission. Now in some other states that varies. In some other states they have different licenses, but in Utah we just have the one license for those things. Okay, now the director of the division of real estate, we didn't talk about this specifically, but they are appointed by who? The executive director of the Department of Commerce. Yeah, that's right. And because if you remember, they are a government employee. So whoever's above them in the employment structure is going to decide who they hire for the next level down. So that's the executive director of the Department of Commerce. But the real estate commission, they're not employees. They are chosen, they, they mostly wrote, work for free, by the way. There's no compensation for being on the real estate commission except for they do get a small per diem to travel. So like the commissioner who's from uh, St. George, the state does pay for them to travel up to the meetings every month. Um, but other than that, they just don't get any compensation for that. So, uh -oh. okay. Now the Utah Division of Real Estate is part of which department or which commission? A. Yep, Department of Commerce. I love it. You guys know all the answers. This is perfect. Hopefully we remember them come test time, right? <laughs> it all seems so easy when you're talking to the teacher, doesn't it? <laughs> Someone asked me, uh, I had an agent friend call and ask me uh, yesterday some questions about uh, one of their clients was in a divorce situation. And so they were wondering uh, who gets the house in the divorce situation. And I'm not a divorce attorney. So I had to definitely give some caveats on what I told them. But their question was, um, if they're uh, if the spouse's, if only one of the spouse's name is on title, in this case, the husband's name was on title and the wife's name was not on title. And my friend agent was representing the, uh, the wife in this situation. And so they were asking if only the husband's name is on title and they get divorced, does the wife have any rights to, uh, to the house at that point? Yes. Yes. So that's an interesting question, right? Now that's not actually a real estate licensing question. So that's actually outside the scope of what we teach uh, in the licensing course. Um, but, but you said yes, and that's mostly true. The community property laws we have basically say that husband and wife who all the property they buy together as the, when they're married is gonna be shared. But it is still complicated by the fact that only one of their names is on the uh, deed. And that's, and, and in some other applications, for example, if I'm representing um, the wife who doesn't have her name on the deed and I want to list her property for sale, um, the real estate licensing laws say that I have to get uh, a signed contract with all of the owners. Now, in this case, the owners is who's on deed, who's on title. So I believe legally I could list their property with only the husband's signature because his is the only name on the title. And so it gets kind of complicated in that way. So, so I basically cautioned my friend as he was talking to his client to let them know that yes, they do have rights to the property, even though their wife's name wasn't on the deed, but it's going to be a little more complicated because of that. So, so they should definitely consult a divorce attorney or a or some other kind of lawyer who knows more about that specific situation. Um, but it's good to be aware of some of those details. 
um, the thing you'll run into as an agent is going to be that side where you want to list the property, but you have to get a listing agreement with all of the owners. And sometimes uh, that's been an issue like uh, uh, if someone goes out of town, like if I, my parents uh, went to New Jersey for a couple of years on a, uh, uh, and so if I wanted to help them sell their house, their name's on title, not mine. And so I would have to somehow get them to sign. And now today with the electronic signature, that's a lot easier than it used to be. Um, but what you still need to make sure, and especially in a divorce situation, is whose names are on title so that you can list the property. And also if the husband wanted to be, uh, if the husband wanted to list the property without his wife's permission, I think technically the real estate agent could list it that way. But when it comes to the money that comes from the property and all that stuff, it would have to be split based on the community property laws. So, so it gets complicated, but as an agent, you have to dig into those details and find out what, uh, what they're trying to accomplish and who needs to be uh, included in the transaction. So, so that's good. Good. Sounds like you got some knowledge about that already. All right. So the Utah Division of Real Estate, diving back in here, uh, is authorized to regulate what? Home prices, real estate commissions, mortgage lending officers, interest rates. The mortgage lending officers. Mortgage lending officers. Is that a consensus? See? Real estate commissions. Okay, it's kind of a tough question, right? Because interest rates are part of commerce. That would maybe be something else. Real estate commissions is definitely something within the industry. Um, home prices, yeah. Yeah, no, they can't dictate home prices. That's just buyers and sellers. Uh, real estate commissions are also uh, up to the parties of the transaction. So that's just between real estate agents and brokers and their clients. The Utah Division of Real Estate doesn't regulate what real estate commissions are at all. So in this case, yeah, it is gonna be mortgage lending officers. But that's an interesting thing, how huh, with the real estate commissions, um, a lot of people think or get the impression because of the way the market is that there's a standard commission rate or a normal commission rate and that does sort of become part of the language that people use. They kind of a talk as if there's a certain real estate commission rate that's normal. Um, but we've actually had a lot of companies come in more recently and, and kind of shake up that model where a lot of agents used to charge about the same rates. Now we have uh, companies that are charging super low rates and it's like a do it yourself thing. You as a client, you come and do it all yourself and we'll only help this much and we'll only charge this much. So that's one business model. And then you've got some other like luxury agents who say, we'll handle every, everything. In fact, I'm also an attorney and I'll handle, you know, your, your, your property transfers and stuff in addition to the real estate thing. And they charge a bigger commission because of additional service that they offer. Now, just to clarify, if they're offering services that are outside of real estate, they would need to have potentially another license and other things outside of there. But the point about real estate commissions is that it's up, to, it's up to you, it's up to the client, it's up to the agent how much they wanna charge, it's up to the client whether they're willing to pay that. So there is no standard commission rate. Okay, who is primarily responsible for enforcing the rules and statutes related to real estate transactions? This is the police, right? This is what we were talking about. This isn't who makes the rules, this is who enforces the rules. The division does. They're the police. Yep, the division of real estate. Now, when they are, one thing I didn't talk about, but is kind of interesting thing is when they when they're coming up with these new rules, um, a lot of times they have they run the rules and proposed laws past the attorney general to get an opinion on it, on uh, to make sure they're not overstepping their bounds, to make sure they're not. Um, you know, doing something that would infringe on another department's jurisdiction uh, and, and people's basic property rights too. So, so there is a lot of uh, cooperation between the Attorney General, the Division of Real Estate, and the Utah Legislature in this case, since that was one of the answers you see. So in fact, when the Division of Real Estate talked and wanted to change this rule that we talked about where three supervised uh, offices is going to change, 
that that was a law that had to go through the Utah legislature because it was written into law. So they did have to cooperate with the Utah legislature and they wrote up the language for a bill. They sent it over to the legislature. They had to get a member of the legislature to sponsor the bill. And, and then the legislature took it. And I don't, I, I'd have to look back and see if they made any changes. I don't think they did. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they have to cooperate with the different branches to make that stuff come together. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to see how it all works together. All right, so the Board of Realtors, we haven't talked about that yet, but it says is a private association of real estate professionals that does what? Does it enforce code of ethics? Is it led by the Real Estate Commission? Does it have regulatory authority? Is it does it administer real estate licensing? What do you think about this one? It would be A, enforces a code of ethics. Enforces a code of ethics? Anybody think anything different? Do you agree with that? I agree. Agree? Well, good, because that's accurate. Do, you, do any of you have any uh, experience with the Board of Realtors or the Real Estate Division? Not yet. Probably not until you become a real estate agent. It's a, it's kind of an inclusive crowd. You could almost call the board of realtors a, it's almost like a union kind of, where it's a group of diverse professionals within an industry that kind of work together for a common goal. Um, a little different than a union because usually unions are helping employees against, not against, but you know to, to protect their rights with, where they work with different companies. Whereas the board of realtors is not so much to help them work together against something else. It's more to help them work friendly with each other because every real estate agent is typically an independent contractor, which uh, in legal terms basically means you're your own business. Every real estate agent is their own business. And so the board of realtors, sometimes called the association of realtors, actually that is their official name, is the national association of realtors. And then they have local uh, boards and associations that are members of that. Um, they uh, primarily work to have agents work well together. And so that's where they enforce a code of ethics. They have a code where they say agents need to treat the public honestly and professionally. They need to treat other agents uh, professionally and courteously and, uh, and the clients, you know, so they've got all these additional rules that they have on top of what the state requires for their licensing uh, that they want agents to uh, follow so that they can work well together. Now, uh, I'm a member of the Association of Realtors in Utah. Uh, the Association of Realtors has the biggest multiple listing service uh, with the most accurate information that, that there is in Utah. And there's actually several multiple listing services in Utah, but there's one here across the Wasatch Front from uh, all the way from Cache Valley, all the way down to Utah County, Central Utah. Most of the state is part of one multiple listing service. And, and because of that, um, a lot of real estate professionals, a lot of members of the public sometimes confuse uh, what the Board of Realtors is and what the Real Estate Commission or the Division of Real Estate is. And so the governing body, the Division of Real Estate, decided that they needed to make sure that agents understand the difference between the two. Because the Board of Realtors is a private organization, whereas the uh, Division of Real Estate is a uh, government entity. So the Division of Real Estate, uh, they have control over your license. You have to follow their rules or you can't sell real estate help people sell real estate legally in the state. The Board of Realtors is just a private organization and so they don't have any control over your license. They can't stop you from legally helping people sell and buy real estate, but they do have some specific services like their code of ethics that you agree to and their multiple listing service uh, that they own. And, if, and so if you want the properties that you help sell to be able to be listed on the multiple listing service, then you would have to be a member of that association or that group in order to do that. But the uh, Division of Real Estate wants to make sure that you know the difference. They want to make sure that you know that one is private and one is government. So that's kind of the point of questions like this is um, they want you to understand that the Board of Realtors is a private association, number one, and what do they do? Well, they've got their code of ethics, they've got their multiple listing service, and that's kind of the core of what they do. 
So if you're going to do residential real estate, you will likely want to join the Association of Realtors just because they're a major player in the market. But it's totally up to you. You know, you're free to choose uh, however you want to do business. All right, moving on. When the Division of Real Estate receives a complaint from the public against a licensed agent, they will notify the agent of a complaint. And how many days does the agent have to respond? 10 days, 15 days, 30 days, 60 days? I think it's 15, so B. Okay, 15. Is that what other people think? Do you have any other ideas? Do you agree? It is A, 10. 10 days? Okay, do we need to set up another room and you guys can duke it out? <laughs> <laughs> We're both members of the association. We'll treat each other fairly and professionally. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Yep. In this case, it is 10 days. And so actually in, um, in Utah real estate license law, there's kind of only two numbers that apply to just about everything when it comes to days to respond. And 10 days is one of those. Like whenever you change your personal information to respond to a complaint, it's 10 days. But then there's a few things where you have 30 days to respond, but those are kind of the only two. Most of them they ask you about will just be 10 days and just a couple might be 30. Okay. All right, my friendly ethical uh, members of the association, when two brokers have a dispute over the commissions earned, the division of real estate will do what? A says they will take no part in disputes about commission unless license law was broken. B says they will put the broker's licenses on probation until the dispute is resolved. C says they will hold a hearing before the commission. And D says they will side with the selling broker. Where do we fall here? This would be A. No part, in, no part in disputes unless there was license law that was affected. Okay, yeah. Yep, and we kind of talked about that a little earlier when we said that they don't regulate commissions. They're not part of that at all. Uh, the commission agreement is between the broker and the seller or the broker and the buyer. Um, and that's just a regular legal contract. And so that's outside the purview of license law because it's not because if you both agree on a commission between the client and the agent, then that's not a question of whether you're treating them fairly or not, because you together agreed on that, right? So, so that's outside their purview. But when you talk about the Association of Realtors, that's another thing that they do do. They, if you're both members of the association, then by joining the association, you have to agree to work together amicably. And so if there is a commission dispute between two, so like, um, um, it's pretty common in, in the market in Utah for a buyer agent and a seller agent to split the commissions. Um, but, uh, and so if the buyer and the seller agent uh, have a fight about how they should divide those up, the Association of Realtors does have a process where they will um, uh, bring them all both in, talk about the dispute, kind of like a mediation process. Um, and actually, I this year, I am currently on the uh, grievance committee. Let's back up. I'm currently on the grievance committee at the state association and the grievance committee is, is kind of the first pass of those kind of complaints. So if somebody says we have a, a dispute over commissions, then the grievance committee on the association of realtors, um, private group, right? They'll, the grievance committee takes all of those complaints and looks at them and says, is this a legitimate complaint, right? Is there enough evidence here to proceed one way or the other? And if there is, then they pass that on to the to another committee called the uh, Professional Standards Committee, who then handles the dispute. They bring them in. They can bring witnesses if they want, you know, and they go through that whole process and make a decision. So, so in that regard, I'm kind of deep into those kind of uh, disputes and and questions, and I love being a part of that process because it really opens my eyes to the kind of uh, the kind of things that go on and the kind of ways that we as agents sometimes. Um, let our own uh, let our own transaction get the better of us, and we and we're kind of blind to what's going on on the other side, and so we don't always treat them fairly. A lot of times, it's 
innocent where we're just trying to do what we think is right and so we forget to do something we should have done we forget to disclose everything or we forget to uh, communicate properly with the other side uh, and other times it is intentional and and just outright wrong um, but that's what the association of realtors does is with those things that the division of real estate doesn't handle disputes between agents about commissions and stuff like that the association of realtors does kind of step in and say we'll mediate those disputes because of the membership you have in our association and the agreement you have here with us so that's pretty cool too now there's definitely flaws in government there's flaws in associations but i think the core purpose of the association is a good one so i'm hoping that my participation is an attempt to continue to to make that a positive and to you know raise up the level of professionalism in the industry all right next one well any questions about that i'm realizing that i haven't asked for questions very often through. So is there anything that you wanted to talk about on these topics before we jump to the next question? Looks like we've only got a few minutes left. So I've got one or two more questions, I think. And then, and of course, anything that you have, we're happy to discuss, so. Okay, next question is, if trust funds are mishandled, the division of real estate will do what? They can freeze the trust account, they will ignore the first offense, they will protect the broker from lawsuits, or they can issue a cease and desist order. D, they'll issue a cease and desist order. That's within their purview and authorization. Yep, that's right. So I would almost say, why can't they freeze the trust account? If the trust funds are being mishandled, why can't they do that? And like you said, that is outside their purview. They don't have that authority, but they can issue a cease and desist order. Now we've actually had some major trust fund mishandling events in the last year or two. Um, not all of them, uh, well, one example, and it's already been in the division newsletter, it's kind of on public record. Um, a, a broker discovered that there was about $400,000 missing from their trust account. And so they investigated and they found out that their office staff who was handling some of those accounts had been uh, falsifying documents. They had been uh, taking the bank statements and modifying them before they gave them to the broker to review, to audit. And they had been using, I guess they had like a signature stamp in the office somehow, which, you know, now that we're talking about a question like this sounds like a terrible idea but they were using a signature stamp to write checks to themselves. And they had basically, this staff member had embezzled $400,000 from the brokerage. Is that, a, is that a small deal or a big deal? <laughs> I tell you, if I had $400,000 of my money go missing, that would be a really big deal. <laughs> that would be a really big deal. Um, as the story goes in this particular instance, the brokerage was able to replace that money with uh, with money that they had access to and so they actually replaced all 400,000 of the dollars and the clients uh, did not suffer any harm directly but the broker in this case was taken before the division of real estate and they said you did not perform proper supervision over your trust account you are the one responsible, right? The buck stops here. The broker is responsible. If those funds go missing, then you are the one who is liable for that. Um, but they also saw that he put all the money back. So they definitely use that information to lighten the sentence a little bit. Um, but he still received some, some fairly hefty fines. And I believe his license was put on probation. But you look at that situation and the broker you almost sympathize with them and say, oh, they didn't do anything wrong. It was the staff member who embezzled, right? <laughs> but that's precisely what the broker license is for, is to make sure that that client money and the trust fund is handled properly. If they hadn't been able to replace that $400,000, that would have been a huge scandal. That would have been a really big deal. Those clients, you know, they could be out, they could be out property. They could be out their house and home. They could, I'm guessing with that level of money that there was multiple clients uh, involved there. So they could have hurt a lot of people if they 
uh, had not been able to make reparations. So very many sales agents, how many sales agents licenses went inactive because of what happened with the broker? In that, <laughs> in that particular one, if they, if they, so in this case, they put the broker on probation, they did not uh, suspend his license. So none of the agents had their licenses inactivated in this particular case. Um, but that's a good point that you make that you've seen in the course, I'm sure, where if a broker has their license revoked, then all of their agents automatically go inactive. And if I'm an agent and I'm working on five deals and my broker suddenly has his license go inactive, I am now not legally able to represent these clients. So that can be a real cascading effect. So, so choose your broker as well. <laughs> Make sure they're gonna take care of you and all of your clients. All right, let's do one last question. When the division of real estate receives a complaint from the public that a broker used trust money for their own business expenses, what'll they do? They will investigate and possibly hold a hearing before the commission. They will keep the complaint on record, but wait to discipline the broker until a more serious offense occurs. They will remove all agent licenses from that brokerage, or they will automatically turn the case over to the attorney general. Would be A. Yeah. They'll investigate and hold a hearing until they until they decide whether the uh, uh, broker is uh, responsible for those funds. Before they decide to revoke a license, they're not going to do anything with the agent's licenses yet. They'll wait until that whole process comes through. So, but when we talk about brokers using trust account money for their own business and stuff. It's a, it's obviously a big no-no, but sometimes with um, modern technology, sometimes people get confused about uh, what counts as a trust account and what counts as a brokerage account or a personal account. For example, with stuff like Venmo or PayPal, if a client wants to send their trust money to the brokerage through one of those services, um, those services basically count as um, bank accounts. So if I had a client send me trust funds by Venmo, that legally is me putting the client's trust money into my personal account. And then I can, of course, transfer that to the brokerage. But as soon as I put that money in my personal account, I've broken license law, right? Because you can never put a client's personal or excuse me, a client's trust funds, the money that is the client's money, into my own account or the brokerage operating account, it can never be in those places. It's got to go straight to the trust account. And that's just to protect the public. Just take care of them. Okay. Okay. You guys sound like you know a lot of the stuff already, which is good. Hopefully going over it today has been good to kind of cement it in your mind so that you can feel confident when you get on the test. I know when I get on the test, sometimes I think I know it. And then I see the question and the way the question's presented makes me doubt it. <laughs> but, uh, but one quick test tip is that statistically, your first instinct is the better answer. So if you're looking at a question, first thing what you ought to do is before you read any of the answers is you read the question, make sure you understand the question. If you understand what the question is asking and then you read the answers, if one of them stands out to you, take it and move on. Don't second guess yourself because it's most likely that your first answer that you chose is correct. Okay. All right. Any and final questions here before we wrap up? What you got? I do have one question and going back to the trust account. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, a personal Venmo. If you have a, can the broker have a Venmo account that links only to that trust account? Because it has to be a bank within the state of Utah credit union. We know that. Right. So can that Venmo, if it's linked directly to, and only can transfer between the broker's trust account at that bank and Venmo. Can they have that ben Venmo account set up? Yes, I believe that would be fine. As long as it's a, basically a Venmo trust account, right? Then, and you receive the money straight to there. And then from there, you transfer it to your other bank account. Then yes, I believe that would be legitimate. But if you use that Venmo account for operations, if you put money in there and spend it for the brokerage, then you've mixed things, right? But if like you described, if it's just an account for trust funds to come in and go straight to the trust account and it's owned by the brokerage, yeah, that should be fine. Thank you, Dan. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll wrap Thank this you. up. What's that, Ian? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Appreciate y'all being here. Uh, we'll be here again in two weeks. 
Um, I don't remember what our topic is. Our topic in two weeks is uh, financing and settlement. Very exciting. That's actually a really big uh, section of the exam. I think you have eight or 10 questions on that. So that'll be a good one to go over. So, hey, look at that. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Tons of notes. Thank you. Awesome. Good. Okay. And any questions you have when it's not every other Tuesday, feel free to give us a call, drop us an email. Uh, we'll help you with any part of it as you go along. But for today, I thank think you. we're done. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again, Dan.